This is China Business Cast, your guide to doing business in the wild, wild east. We're here to get detailed and get personal with experienced entrepreneurs making things happen in China. If you want to learn from on-the-ground accounts of how business actually gets done, this is the program for you. Hello and welcome to China Business Cast. I'm your host JP. So we're back to our regular scheduled program after a lengthy hiatus for the New Year and Chinese New Year. I myself am back in China after a trip to sunny Southern California to visit my parents for Chinese New Year. So today's episode, we have a special program. Last year, I contributed as a researcher to the Wood Egg Project, a series of guides for entrepreneurs on how to do business in Asia. The project covers 16 different countries and explores the economic, legal, cultural, and practical details of how to start and run a business. I contributed to the research for the China edition, and this is one of the interviews that I conducted. So consider this an excerpt of the 2014 Wood Egg Entrepreneur's Guide to China. In this interview, we get into the details of how to set up a Chinese company, the pros and cons of different corporate structures, and some regulatory and tax implications as well. If you're interested in this kind of granular information about how to do business in China. Then definitely check out the Wood Egg Project China 2014 book, and we'll link up to that in the show notes. So, without further ado, here is the interview. Today's guest is Fabian Knopf, senior associate at Dizen Shira, a consulting and advisory firm focusing on services for foreign direct investment in Asia. Fabian is an expert in legal structuring, cross-border taxes, as well as HR laws and practices for foreign companies in China and Hong Kong. Today, we discuss how to set up a Chinese company, the different options, and the pros and cons. Number one, options for business structures in right, China. Right. Yeah. Let me let me start at the bottom with the least、um, with the, with the easiest form, essentially, which is a representative office,、mm -hmm. um, which is really a which doesn't. It's not its own entity. It belongs to the to the investor、uh, outside of China. You can employ people here. You have you can rent an office here. Everything is legal.、Um, the, well, the, the employment is is through a third party, and you are only allowed to do non、uh, non profit generating activities. For example,、uh, research、uh, liaison with suppliers, finding customers, market research in general,、uh, just you know staying in touch, having having an office. Having a showroom, for example, just just being somewhat of a base in 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 China for yeah for for a company that is not and doesn't want to doesn't want to make that jump. The next step would be a wholly foreign-owned entity, which is a or commonly referred to as a wufi.、Um, that one is essentially a limited liability company as we know it as well. It has its own entity here in China. There's a registered capital or an investment connected to that.、Uh, you can employ people here directly.、Um, There's, you know, basically a business scope that has to fall into a certain category、um, of the foreign investment catalog.、Uh, you know, there, there's three categories. Essentially, it's,、um, uh, it's it's restricted. It's there's encouraged and there's allowed. Basically, so、okay. there's there's、uh, or it's non-restricted. Essentially, so then the joint venture、um, is, you know, essentially just the the joining of two、uh, two entities into one. Basically, the same for the Wufi as well. Um, same characteristics. Other than that, maybe a, the foreign investment、uh, catalog might actually have a requirement for a joint venture with a certain percentage, with certain ownership of one party、uh, toward another. That that entity, that joint venture, can then move into a more restricted、uh, investment category of the catalog. But yeah, that's it's just a joint venture anywhere else.、Uh, very similar to other places as well. There's there's a there's a fourth one essentially, which is a foreign invested partnership. Uh, which is, you know, specifically for、uh, for venture capital firms, for example, that that want to invest into China. It's not an entity itself; it's more of a, of a business structure. So the FIP itself doesn't have a, a an entity itself. It doesn't need to be registered.、Um, it's a bit difficult right now.、Uh, legislation was passed in 2011 or came into effect、uh, in 2010. Up until now, there's not that many in China.、Mm -hmm. It's very difficult for authorities, even in Shanghai or Beijing, to to grant. Approval for this, so it seems to be a very, very controlled、uh, entity. There's、uh, Callaway Group has one with、uh, Fosun, Fosun Group in in Shanghai with a, it's a hundred million dollar fund, 
and there's a few other examples that have uh, that have been come up, but it's really, I guess, it kind of relates to the financial uh, development of China, of institutions, and and the market in general, which is not very progressive. Um, so that, that maybe that's also why it's not been uh, not been making much headway into mm -hmm. the market. So it's really the representative office, the Wufi and a joint venture right now. Okay, can you uh, just to give sort of perspective? Most big companies, when they come to China, right. if they're like a big brand, like right. BMG, for right, example, right, right, right. what are they using? They're using a Wufi. Okay. Most of the time, exactly. Yeah. Um, I guess some of the famous J JVs are like Volkswagen. Exactly. Yeah. So the automotive industry was one of the restricted industry that was uh, actually redacted um, from last year, I want to say. Uh, so that's not a requirement anymore. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for for foreign, you know, they still have to be approved, and it's, it's certainly not an easy process right. to go through that. But it does, for example, one of the requirements is not necessarily Chinese ownership, or you know, part Chinese ownership anymore. So before there was a requirement that the, the Chinese side needed to own a certain percentage exactly, if you right. want to do that's automotives. Right. That's correct. Yeah, I see. That's right. So that's an example of JV, and like, who has representative offices? Like, like um, research firms. Uh, no, no. Research is one of those that falls into the restricted category. Research oh, okay. is is bad. Oh, um, I see. if it yeah, it's one of those things where um, where uh, the authorities will okay. ask further questions and you know, in when in doubt, uh, uh, not uh, approve that entity. Oh, I see. So, uh, so the representative office would be a, a typical model is a sourcing model. Where you uh -huh. essentially have a you know the, the typical South China uh, model, I, I would almost call it, uh -huh. is you know you have a, a company in Hong Kong, you have a, um, a representative office here in China in yeah. Dongguan or Shenzhen or wherever, uh, and essentially you have people in that representative office that will go to the factories and do quality control, and you know you run around with all the with, with the samples and make sure that yeah. whatever the Hong Kong company wants is being executed here. And then the factory ships to uh, to the Hong Kong company. So there's no there's no um, invoicing with the RO. The invoicing is always between the, the factory and, and the Hong Kong company. So it's you know it's kind of a helper, I guess, if you like, in that sense. And it's you know just like a, a market entry, right? You just kind of want to see is there you, exactly for 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 market research, essentially not for other clients, but for yourself. Is there a demand for my product? Um, or my services, and right. just kind of start off with that. Also, law firms have to be registered as a special representative office. They can't register as a limited liability company, for example. Okay. What about those, I guess, consulting firms that are international? Those are um, the well, con they're consulting firms, then, right? I mean, so uh, the big four, for example. Yeah. Say, so right. like BCG well, has an office in Beijing. Right. Well, they are management consulting, so right. they they would most likely be uh, Wufi. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, it's the same for us. I mean, we're we're a consulting company, uh, yeah. and we which is a woofy in that okay. sense. There, are, there are strict, sort of. Well, I don't know about strict. There are supposed limitations on the representative offices. Yes. And has the rec like, like has the enforcement gotten more strict recently? Um, because there were probably say, people running around doing things with representative offices that they weren't supposed to. Right? Yes. Um, so there's and, and and there's you know many many different ways that people have gotten creative uh, in terms of um, so the, the problem is if you and I'm, I'm sure this is just one way of. How people have misused uh, the representative office in some way. If you want to buy something in China, you usually need, a, need an invoice. Mm -hmm. um, so you and and with the representative office, you can actually uh, buy something essentially. Um, so you know, in in what way that really benefits the the representative office now is is, is um, up to interpretation really. Um, but they could, for example, just get fa uh, these invoices, these official invoices, fa piao, in some way through illegal channels, obviously, and then just pay with the money that they receive from their mother company for a certain kind of product. Uh, and then I'm not sure whether they'd be like how, how they would be able to get it out of the country, then, but I'm sure it's possible. Which again is it's not within the scope of a representative office. Right. Um, so yes, that has been something that's been cracked down on and and actually been addressed by legislation. Uh, in 2011, which basically limited also the number of um, uh, foreign employees that could be hired and made it uh, raise the tax rate, effective tax rate on, on uh, representative offices, and then just made sure you know you are not like explicitly saying this is not allowed, this is illegal. Mm -hmm. Okay, and for companies looking to enter China, is there any advantage to setting up in Hong Kong first? Is there any special advantage? Yes. Um, 
but not to every company. Uh -huh. um, there is one one big advantage, is I guess, and it, but this requires a bit of planning. Is the um, um, is any business that benefits from the SIPA, which is the Closer Economic Partnership Agreement between Hong Kong and and yeah, Hong Kong and the Chinese mainland, which is essentially saying, um, for example, uh, one example is the tourism industry, again a restricted uh, industry in China. Um, so if you are a foreign entity that's been set up, I think it has to be five years in in Hong Kong, has all the the necessary licenses in Hong Kong as well, be registered as a as a as a tourism provider um, with all the chops and um, and uh, approvals. Then when you then make uh, an investment into China and say, okay, I want to do this now, and then be able to say, look, this is what I've done in, in, in Hong Kong and under this agreement, I can do this, this and this now. And I don't, you know, I'm not restricted. I can actually do these things. Then that is beneficial to having a, a Hong Kong company and having a business there. So what entity would be they be once they come to China? There, there would also be a Wufi. There would also oh, okay. be a Wufi in that sense, right? But not everyone can just come and set up that Wufi. Exactly. Oh, That's right. Um, other, you know, but but a lot of people come uh, and and say well, you know I, I have a China business and they really only have a Hong Kong office which doesn't really you know it doesn't really matter whether you have that office in Hong Kong or in New Jersey there's no difference mm -hmm. you know exporting is all the same you can't invoice or you can't issue any official Chinese invoices you're closer geographically yes but that's that's it. Yeah, the next one we already talked about some of the advantages and right. disadvantages. Of the each kind of businesses, um, I can I can go a little bit more maybe just into yeah just a, a quick uh, comparison. So the the representative office is is fairly low cost in starting up. So you, you don't have to put up a registered capital, and uh, there's no initial investment. You essentially just feed it money uh, mm -hmm. every month, every quarter. Um, there's a limited business scope, although of course, like you're not no profit making activity, and it's not scalable, uh, and it's not scalable because at least not uh, from a from a from a monetary perspective, um, you pay an effective tax rate on costs. So the higher your costs go, the more people you hire, the bigger office that you have to rent, the more you know, the more cost your people generate, mm -hmm. the higher your tax bill goes. So there's no right. there are no economies of scale. No. Uh, unless you know your profit margin uh, in 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 Hong Kong or wherever you are is, is is dramatically increasing as well, and you can make that justification right for for you internally, right. but that's usually not the case. Mm -hmm. um, so at, at some point, it's a lot much worse to get taxed on cost than on profit. It's, right? it's awful. It's <laughs> awful. Exactly. Um, so you know we've had uh, clients that are you know they they occupy a whole floor of a building with over a hundred people. Uh -huh. uh, you know, there, there were big companies too, for granted, but it's not an efficient model. It's not right. what you want to run even midterm. It's something that you, you want to, you know, have in mind. Okay, I want, I need to move to a Wufi. This is the, the much better, more more suitable option here. For a Wufi, you know, relatively high startup cost. Um, you have a the, the registration process is, is quite long and tedious, and you have to put up a registered capital and. Um, and, and you know, has there been a trend of like that going up recently? Um, not by the law, no. Oh, okay. um, right, the legislation doesn't doesn't have anything like that. They have you know a minimum that is written in, in the legislation, on, uh, but it is the case that it's generally higher, and especially in uh, areas where you know clusters like the CBD. Oh, it depends on the. Okay. Because you always have to see um, the law is written by Beijing, but it's being implemented by by Fujian, by Shenzhen. Well, it's Shenzhen here. Mm -hmm. So the the offices have a certain quota that they have to meet uh, in terms of foreign investment attracted. Yeah. So they will set that quota, and uh, they will set the the, the registered capital uh, amounts according to the quota that they will have to meet. So they they have their own interests in that as well. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something that to to keep in mind as well. And the Wufi has, you know, also you know, in terms of compliance costs as well. You know, you have to uh, put up with taxes that are a bit more complicated than just for the representative office. But you can be a full market participant. Yeah, you, you're essentially free to to do whatever you do within the business scope that you've been assigned, or not been assigned, but that you have chosen essentially within the restrictions of the foreign investment catalog. Um, joint venture also high startup cost, which is essentially not not much different uh, from the Wufi. There's a few more things that you have to do uh, before um, before the regular registration. You just kind of have to figure out yourself uh, within the two or more partners what you want to do. 
better there could be better market access you know with a Chinese partner for example you can you can be introduced into a certain market to, to customers to suppliers um, might also be easier dealing with authorities although you don't want to uh, step over the line of being into illegality essentially you know guanxi is nice but you always there's not there's not always 100 percent clear whether or not this is this is um, this is legal uh, right. so there are there are advantages and disadvantages to that okay I think um, yeah I think that's a good summary let's move on to the next one uh, any advice on naming businesses in China are English names okay or should they be localized and maybe a little bit about how localization happens it's kind of interesting right, right? like like McDonald's is sort of a phonetic localization mm, and mm. Pizza Hut is a very odd localization yeah. which is like must win customer yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if you guys advise companies on this how, right. how, how is that process managed is this some dude at the company who decides or is there right. like a localization right. naming company that right has? No. Um, um, so, in terms of registering the company as a legal entity, uh, you first of all you have to have a Chinese name. Okay. You can pretty much pick whatever English name you want. Uh, there's no you don't register that name at least not with yeah. the with the with registration authority. So that has to be a name, and there's there's certain restrictions of what you can say. For example, you can't just use the word the name China uh, like Zhongguo. Um, or, or others, um, so they have to be somewhat correspondent to what you do as well. Mm-hmm. Um, although, I mean, again, like there's, you, you have a lot of freedom in a way, but you can't just go uh, and, and do whatever you want. So and when you essentially pick that name and then think about like what makes sense, um, what we do here, or and I'm sure that this is mostly what, what companies do, um, you know, you, you kind of make sure that it doesn't, that it's not something stupid. And yeah. it doesn't uh, doesn't mean tampons. Exactly, or exactly. When you want to sell, I don't, you know, right. But I mean, we're not a marketing. I guess that would be kind of a PR company's um, a job, and and I'm not. I so I guess do they have to operate under the same Chinese name that they registered, or yes. can they have like operating as? Well, like yeah. is my download right. the registered right, name right. of McDonald's? I, I'm not 100% sure, but I would think so. It might just be their brand. You don't really have to put your company name up on the board if okay. you're selling burgers, right? Yeah. Uh, you, you know, you have to have your business license in the, in the shop and um, that, that you can see in every restaurant and, and there it has to be so you show your real name, but that is not going to, you know, it's not going to hurt your, uh, your customer experience uh-huh. in that sense. So, so you can, the legal name of your company could be it has to be Chinese, but it right. could be just something you keep on. Exactly, it, it just has to be your company registered name. You don't have to, you know, go advertising with it. It just yeah. has to be on all the the necessary documents, essentially, which is usually just stuff that you need in accounting or or just legal compliance. It's not something that you go marketing with necessarily. Okay. Um, okay, so let's talk about the next one, which is how long does it take to incorporate a business structure in China? Right. Um, I guess that we'd have to separate between the different types. Of right. Generally, uh, a representative office would take about two months, maybe three months. And and what I'm the what I'm using here is is usually when then the company is is all set up. It has bank accounts. It has a tax registration. Mm-hmm. It, it can essentially operate. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, same with the Wufi. It's about four to six months. Uh, you know, within two or three months, within two months, essentially, you have a business license, but you can't do anything with it yet. You don't have bank accounts. You don't have, um, you know, you don't have any money. Right. <laughs> so there, there's, you know, you can sign labor contracts, but you, you can't do anything with them, essentially, because you can't actually pay your, your, your employees. So um, that's, you know, there's, um, there's that differentiation between company legally exists and you can actually use it. What's the most time-consuming part of like the two months to get a Woofie set up? Is it just waiting to hear back on approval? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's really the, the, one of the big problems is that you essentially have a step-by-step process. Mm-hmm. Um, so you do have to get approval from two authorities here: it's BofTech and, and AIC, which are, which are the two. Um, so BofTech is the Bureau of um, um, uh, Foreign Trade and Economic Commission, or yeah, and then you have AIC, which is the Administration for Industry and Commerce. Uh, so those two entities have to have to approve. That usually, yeah, that usually takes a month and a half essentially. And then, and before that, there's a couple of things you need a lot from the investor, and there's a lot of paperwork for them to to go through. It needs to be prepared, it needs to be signed. Lots of, yeah, exactly, lots of uh, passports and and 
has to be all the right uh, color and, and and whatnot. So there's there's a lot of a um, lot of things that need to be done before that. But yeah, it it, it actually does take um, that long, essentially a month and a half for for the authorities to come through. It's not just all it's not all the client side, no. And uh, right, joint ventures are essentially the same about four to six months. So it's it's really the the client side or the the the, the company that then wants to set up. Um, it'll take them a lot longer with the Woofie than than with the Woofie, and and a, and a foreign investor inter, a foreign investor partnership, the FIP, is uh, also it's a you know on on paper and and what's been done before. It's not it doesn't take very long. It's a fairly easy registration process because there's not a lot of restrictions on it at all. But again, it's one of those things that just doesn't get approved because people don't or the authorities don't want to or we're not 100 percent sure. It's been very quiet around it. Okay, um, so next is. The cost, including service fees, right. government fees, right? I, th- I think it's anywhere between. I mean, we've you know the good thing is we we, we do both, right? We we set up companies and we're accountants. Right. So when a company has been set up, not by us, we can still see how much uh, somebody else charged them for it, and <laughs> we've seen some pretty awful figures. Uh, can you give like a range of right, exactly, yeah. And so for example, like a a a bad example or. A very high example is like an American law firm was charging uh, their client, you know, by the by the hour, which is oh boy, which is you know, I think they were somewhere at uh, two hundred thousand RMB, um, mm-hmm. which you know, I, I think that's that's probably the high end, but I'm sure it's not it's not the ceiling. I'm sure it gets higher. Mm-hmm. Um, you can probably get it as cheap as uh, maybe ten or twenty thousand RMB. Mm-hmm. Um, With all the fees and everything. Um, well, yeah, maybe maybe not that, but I mean, so I, I put a range down here from twenty to to about two hundred thousand. Right. Um, it really depends on which service provider you have, whether they're foreign, whether they have some kind of a foreign connection, whether they're Hong Kong, whether they're Chinese, whether they're multinational. So there's there's a there's a big range as well. And then what I mentioned earlier, what exactly does it include? Does it include getting the business certificate uh, that that shows you that the company exists, or does it also include bringing in the capital? And you know, opening bank accounts, these kind of things, because that doesn't necessarily always is included what people quote. So um, you do need to make sure that you compare in equals, which is sometimes difficult because it's a it's a process with a lot of steps. Okay, yeah, I think that's that's a good description of the range. I guess uh, what what is the not the mean but the median, sort of the most common um, cost around. Is it closer to twenty or closer to two hundred? I no, imagine no. it's closer to twenty. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you know reasonably you can you can expect something between fifty and a hundred probably. Okay. That um, again, I, I think there there are definitely Chinese firms who do it for cheaper, and there's definitely foreign firms who do it for for more. Okay. Um, this, I mean, these are all ranges that are essentially for companies who are, you know, simple trading companies that don't need any uh, any other licenses. For example, just you know, the regular import and export licenses, nothing special. Yeah. Um, but if it's you know, high alcohol uh, license, uh, distribution license, or a catering license, or you know, the th- things that are not within the the regular business scope and that does require pro- uh, other licenses, that would add to the cost, obviously. But just the, the business structure, essentially, that would allow you to, to, to do certain things without any any exceptions, I mean, without anything special. That's that's what we're talking about here. Uh-huh. Okay, well, that ties in into the next question, which is, you know, how right. can new businesses find out which permits are necessary? Um, so maybe can you just in broad strokes paint mm. maybe the categories or, you know, the, the uh, different things right. that might require permits? Right. And then obviously uh, they probably need professional help to right. understand. Um, I mean, the, the, just initially, right? I mean, how, how can they find out whether there is anything? Um, the default answer is always check. You have to check with the authority that, that you want approval from. Uh-huh. That is going to be your, that, that's the that's the best source. Yeah. There's no, there's nothing else really. Um, <clears throat> obviously, you have people that have been working with that authority for for some time, and they they would know that as well. But the ultimate source is really the the guys that will don't look at the law because that that's not necessarily helpful. Um, but the authority that that will actually approve you. Um, <clears throat> as I said, you know anything in, in food circulation, for example, if you want to certify, you know, a certification company, certain products or like 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 food circulation. I just said seafood, raw seafood. 
um, so milk, um, so uh, cultural goods. So there, there, there's a lot of things. Um, Are they all under the same, I no. guess, branch of government that governs it? No, no, different? unfortunately not. No, there's there's different um, there's different bureaus essentially that are, that are in charge of that. So. Yeah, it's <laughs> um, if you're give lucky, a, uh, there's advisory it, it's not. Yeah. So everything is extremely decentralized in China in a way. Right. If you think yeah. about it, that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. But one of the that, that's kind of the Beijing consensus that you have a lot of people in the room and all of them have to agree. So it's kind of a, it's kind of, you know, everybody has the same vote, but but it, the, the vote doesn't count if not everybody agrees. Right. Right. Um, so that's what you need to make sure. And then that's kind of one of the things also in terms of um, accountability. Nobody's ever accountable because there's no in, it's, there's not one party in charge. There's always at least two people that are involved in something or in two organizations. So that's what makes it difficult. So that, and that's why, why it's extremely important to make sure that you um, that you plan such a process. So if you, for example, sometimes it makes it makes sense to get the license after you get the business registration, and sometimes it makes sense to get it before it. So, you, but you need to make sure what why is that, and it depends on locality. It depends on on the kind of license you're getting. Um, right, that it's unfortunate like that. Um, some cities have set up one-stop service centers. Uh, Suzhou, for example, has it. Uh, I don't think Shenzhen has it yet. I don't think Guangzhou has it. But there's several cities who've been forward-thinking in that way, and it's, it's, it's been very helpful, obviously. To, so you just go. I want to open a business. You, you that just does go, this. and you have the AIC right there. You have the BofTech right there. You have the tax bureau. You have you have essentially all of the uh, entities that that you need to check in with. Uh, all there and have a counter, and you just go there and, and talk to them. I mean, you can spend plenty plenty of time there as well. But yeah, at least you have them in, in, all in the same place, and you don't have to uh, walk, uh, you know, drive from office to office. Right. So those are essentially the the sources um, where you need to look. You know, I'm sure there's plenty of online blogs that you can look at as well. I mean, we 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 have one China briefing, but it's you know, um, you can get a general idea, but you will never. It's not it's not legal advice in that sense. You you should definitely always check with the source. Mm -hmm. Okay. So once you know which permits you need, how right. can a new business get all get of them. it? Right. Yeah. Um, some of them, most of them, or yeah, most of them. I guess the regular channels. For some of them, you might not. You know, author the authority might not be. Um, yeah, might accommodating. Yeah, exactly. Might not be accommodating. That was the word I was looking for. And you might have to essentially use an agent that has Guanxi or whatever you want to call it, uh -huh. and I'm using that term uh, for a reason, um, to uh, to essentially make sure that that that, that it ha happens. And right. and that's a fairly you know I want to call it, I don't want to really say efficient, but it's it, it's a way that works. Yeah. You know, it's not efficient, but it works. True. Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so those are essentially the two the two ones that you can do. What is in terms of trading company? What's the right. most Common permit. Um, well, I mean, food, food is actually is quite a bit. You know, just um, recording, uh, <laughs> uh, just trading. Um, you know, importing. I mean, milk powder has been huge, right? So um, they need a special permit just to import milk powder, or uh, yeah, that's right. Just milk powder. Um, well, right. Like all yeah. dairy products. Right, exactly dairy products, and then there's uh, customs needs to approve that. So it's it's a it's a very tight process that needs to a company needs to go through. Not just in registration, but also then in, in, in actually every time customs is bringing them in, essentially. And you know, as what I said before, for for alcohol, uh, for any kind raw of fish, alcohol. any mm, well, there's they, they differentiate between just regular alcohol like beer and then like high spirits, essentially. Oh, okay. um, so yeah, I heard getting a wine importation license in China is very tough. Right, and then I mean importation is and then just circulation. Okay. Right. That that's uh, and then you know a restaurant needs special special licenses for example hygiene uh, they need to pass that which is um, which is not that easy either. It's it's, it's hard to hard to make uh, generalizations really, but for for uh, trading companies uh, the one that pops into my head is really really the food. Okay. Cool. Um, let's uh, jump to the next one. What are the current tax rates for right. businesses? Right. So we have a, a corporate income tax at twenty five percent. We have a business tax that uh, ranges between five and twenty percent, which is mostly five percent for 
yeah, the most applications. What's the sort of difference practice. between the two? Taxes? Um, well, corporate ta corporate income tax is, is a is a tax that's levied on on business profits, uh -huh. and then a business tax is just a transaction based tax actually. So oh, for okay. and it's it's all services. Gotcha. So you know, just for a service transaction of you know, um, you know, like a consulting agreement essentially, it would be five percent right. business tax on that. Although. Um, business tax is slowly being replaced by VAT as well. I mean, they've been starting to reform from last year in January in, in Shanghai. It's been implemented, or it's being implemented now across the country from this month. Uh, there's a, a consumption tax as well, which ranges greatly. It's not, it's not, it's not even possible to put a range on it. I mean, you could say from 0% to, uh, to about 56 or 59%. It really so for example consumption it's like a luxury tax almost mm -hmm. where so, does that get taxed so i'm assuming uh, right at different points usually uh on import is a big okay. is a big point um and then uh, but also in, in manufacturing not often in trading for example uh, so okay. usually at where, where it where it enters so there, and that differs as well so the highest ones are in tobacco for example that's around uh, the, the the higher 50s uh, you have it on, on oil, on cars, on luxury products, watches uh, that, that are being imported, for example. I see. Okay, so say you're a French grocery store or whatever, mm -hmm. so everything that is sold has a business tax? No, that would have a VAT on it. So what's, what's the, the difference because, that, that, because that's a goods and services tax more related. So e okay. everything that's a good, that's a, that's a product essentially, that's definitely a VAT. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then, so there's only, if, or there's still services that are taxed on business with business tax. Oh, I but see. But there are already some services that are taxed uh, with VAT. Oh, okay. So business tax was supposed to apply to services, but it's being exactly, but exactly, it's being pulled. Uh, okay. being pulled away. And, and the idea is, uh, you know, just to make actually there's a there's a tax saving for, for, for service providers because they can also use the VAT that they get in and uh, reconcile it with, with the see. goods that they have. It doesn't work everywhere yet. Like the South, for example, hasn't gotten the memo yet. But uh, in Shanghai, that's that's the case already. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. And then if you're the French grocer and you're importing some luxury Watches foods, or, right. oh, yeah. Yeah. some certain things, uh, spirits, maybe, right. then that would get another consumption tax right, added exactly. on top of it. Exactly. And then that would only be on import essentially. And then, you know, the suppliers kind of, or the importers kind of stuck with that, right? Yeah. They're, they're kind of they paid that much. That's and then they want to get, they want to get the cost back and they pass it on to consumer. Right. You know, at the end of the day, you know, whether it's con consumption tax or corporate income tax, the consumer that why, That's why wine's so expensive in China, right? Exactly. Yeah, that, that's why, you know, Porsche and Lamborghini are so expensive. Right. They're, they're, they are, they're about 40%, they're about 40% uh, more expensive. And then at the end of whatever financial period, you also get taxed on your profits and that's Exactly, 25%. and that's the corporate income tax, 25%, okay. that's correct, yeah. So that's the excerpt of the interview for today's show. If you found the information useful, you'll want to go to woodegg.com and check out the complete 2014 Entrepreneur's Guide to China. It features research from dozens of interviews and covers a set of topics very relevant to anyone interested in starting a business in China. From how to set up a company, to how to find an office, to how to hire people, to tips and guidelines on navigating Chinese business culture. We'll be linking up to that in the show notes. Hope you've enjoyed this episode of China Business Cast. Head over to ChinaBusinessCast.com and enter your email to get on the list. I'll announce guests before I interview them, and you'll get a chance to submit your question for the show. Till next time, thank you for listening.